Okay, sorry, got to start over. So today we're going to be talking about chapter six, which is about viruses. Again, it is a very general introduction to viruses. It is not super specific about particular viruses that cause particular diseases. We will get to those when we actually start talking about the different diseases. I will, I'm going to be using today a set of PowerPoints that I have from an older edition of the book. I think it's back to the fourth edition. Pay no attention to the words on the PowerPoints. I know many of you are just like, can't you post all the PowerPoints? Can't you give us all the PowerPoints? And the answer is, I can, but that's not what I'm going to ask you on the test. I'm going to ask you on the test the things that we actually go over. And if um, I don't go over it and it's in the PowerPoint set and you study it, then that's just a waste of your time. So uh, I will, like I said, if I have time, I will go through and make a set of just the pictures as PowerPoints from this edition of the textbook. Um, if I don't, you'll just have these, the ones that I'm gonna use today, you'll have them embedded in this video. So you'll just have to watch the video if you wanna see um, the pictures that I'm using. Okay, so there is also a note outline for this chapter. I would again suggest that you get it off of Canvas. I can't today for whatever reason, 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock seems to be a busy time for the college website and I can't get in. So this is the note outline, just putting it up here. Uh, the only reason I'm showing this to you is because we are gonna generally follow this note outline today, except when we get to letter C here. I'm not gonna talk about animal viruses first. I'm gonna talk about letter E here, section E, bacteriophage first, and then we'll go back and talk about animal viruses. So that's in a flip-flop order. And the reason is because I made the outline to match the order of things in your textbook. But during my lectures, I like to talk about bacteriophage multiplication first, because then when we talk about animal viruses, it goes a little faster because you're already familiar with basically how viruses reproduce. There is another little section here that's not on the outline about um, prions and viroids. I think your book lists them at the very end. Um, other non-cellular infectious agents, um, yes, prions and viroids, and I will mention those at the end, but again, very briefly. I will try to add that to the note outline. So I'm gonna make a few notes to myself here. Um, add. Prions and viroids to the notes. And also, um, okay. So I'm going to stop sharing the note outline with you because most of you should already have that and you can just follow along. And what I would like to share with you while I'm talking a little bit, and then I'll probably draw some on the board as well. Um, a little bit about uh, viruses themselves. So first thing about viruses, and again, it's in that list on your note outline, the first thing we need to stress about viruses is that they are not living things. We refer to them as obligate intracellular parasites, and that is because they cannot survive very long outside of their host cells. Number one, not living things. They are obligate intracellular parasites. If they are not inside of a cell, they are not infectious as far as they cannot multiply and cause an infection in a person unless they are inside of their host. Second thing, they are host cell specific primarily. So for example, if there's a virus that's infecting a plant or a fungus or a protist, it is usually not able to infect humans different host. Can you ingest a protist that has a virus that's infecting that protist? Absolutely. Will that have some effect on your body? Maybe, right? But it is not an infection of a virus. It would be an infection of the protist, okay? So bearing in mind, there are viruses for all kinds of living cells. There are viruses that are specific for bacteria, viruses specific for protists, fungus, plants, and animals. And even within the animal kingdom, there are viruses that can move across uh, genus lines, but predominantly viruses tend to be species specific, except for a few that can recombine in another animal and then reinfect a human. So 
flu is a great example of a virus that can infect. There are different versions of the virus or different types of the virus that infect birds, pigs, and people. But you're not actually getting the exact same virus that infects just birds. Okay, so particularly with RNA viruses, there's a little more variability of what they can infect, but those viruses aren't going to infect plants, for example. So there's a limit to how far evolutionarily, for example, a virus can move from one type of organism to another. Now, there's a list. This list is in your textbook in a purple box. It's table 6.1. Um, I've condensed the list. It's on the top of your a handout that I um, posted, that the note outline that I posted. Blah, blah, blah. Basic structure. This is pretty key. Um, all viruses, to be considered a virus, they have to have some sort of nucleic acid and then a protein coat or a shell around that nucleic acid. That first protein coat is called a capsid. And you do need to know that their nucleic acids can be of various types. Viruses, last chapter we only talked about double-stranded DNA as nucleic acid and being transcribed into RNA and then the RNA being translated into protein. In the case of viruses, they may not, they may have double-stranded DNA for their nucleic acid. They may also have single-stranded, sorry, they may have double-stranded DNA, single-stranded DNA, double-stranded RNA, single-stranded RNA that is a template strand, single-stranded RNA that is not the template strand, or multiple strands of RNA. So it's a lot more complex as far as what can be their nucleic acid, but whatever it is, that's where their genome is. That's what contains the code for the virus to be able to make a copy of itself or to multiply inside its host. But remember, without the host, virus can't multiply. Excuse me a second. Uh, blah, blah, blah. Some viruses also have uh, spikes on outside of their capsid, and those spikes usually are in a virus that has an envelope, and those spikes are for the virus to attach to its host cells, usually. Um, usually viruses do not contain any metabolic enzymes, meaning they can't make their own ATP, and they also usually lack ribosomes or the machinery to make proteins. Remember, they're obligate intracellular parasites, which means they can only make a copy of themselves inside a host cell. So I've compressed that list a little bit. Like I said, it's in your book, table 6.1, and on your outline, it's a little bit shorter list because I just squished some of those things together. Size is also really important. Viruses are teeny tiny. And um, again, the words are not important here. In fact, I'm going to uh, get rid of them because um, the only things that you really need to know are, you don't need to know about this, you don't need to know the size of any particular viruses. The point of this uh, diagram is to show you, so I'm going to get rid of this, make it much smaller, is to just show you the, the pictures so you can see um, this is E. coli, so this is, and these are yeast cells. So E. coli is very small, and once we actually take a look at it under the microscope, you'll see it's really hard to tell it's even rod-shaped. Here's a streptococcus bacteria, and then all of these are viruses, right, all the way down to polio, which is 30 nanometers. And then I included a few pictures of viruses, what they look like under the microscope, because you can only see them with an electron microscope. So my recollection is that uh, B here is Ebola virus. Looks like A is vaccinia. That's what we use to immunize you against smallpox. And I think this is also vaccinia, but it's a scanning electron micrograph rather than a transmission where this one you can see is cut right through. And I just include these uh, pictures because they're um, show you a little bit more detail how some viruses have an envelope which is a protein and usually phospholipid uh, layer outside of the capsid. And um, viruses, that's going to be how they're going to be classified. Here's some other pictures of just some viruses. Here's a tobacco mosaic virus. This is the first virus that was ever isolated. You can see it has RNA for its nucleic acid. And then there's no envelope. It just has this capsid shell around it made of protein. And then this is a much more complex virus. 
I believe this is influenza that we're looking at here. Just double checking my uh, pictures. But yeah, I think that's a flu virus. And you can see that flu virus is super complicated. It has seven different strands of RNA as its genome and each strand of RNA is covered in protein. And then, um, so we would call those nucleocapsids. And then you can see it's obviously an enveloped virus and the green things sticking out are the spikes. These spikes, this is what gives flu its designation of H1N1. Some of these spikes are for neuraminidase and some are for uh, that's the end. hemagglutinin, this is the other one. And it depends on which versions the virus has in its envelope. Those spikes, again, animal virus, so those spikes are important because that's how the virus is going to attach to its host. Here are just some more beautiful pictures of some viruses. This guy is uh, herpes virus here. It's a DNA virus and they've labeled, they've stained the virus with different colors. You can see it also has an envelope. And this is an adenovirus. Again, I'm just, just because the pictures are pretty. This virus is a bacteriophage. So we're gonna come back to this particular uh, picture several times because this is where we're going to start talking about um, all of the methods that viruses actually infect cells. I'm gonna stop that for a second. And I want to talk to you a little bit about, not a lot, but a little bit about how viruses are classified. That's up here at the top of the handout. The main classification occurs, there's only three orders, and I believe those are three orders of animal viruses. So actually, sorry, this has been updated to nine orders for animal viruses. So let's just change that. Nine orders for animal viruses on 134 families. So the numbers are going up. 34 families, and I don't have a number for the um, genera, so I'm gonna take that off. Viruses are only classified usually as far as order, and that's because, remember, they're um, infecting cells. So, and again, this is for uh, animal viruses. So there are other sets for plant viruses and of course for bacteriophage. I'll put a colon there, I guess. Most animal virus names, family names end in viridae and they are classified by the following criteria. First, what type of nucleic acid they have and there's a particular order to this. It goes um, just like I've listed here, double-stranded DNA, single-stranded DNA double-stranded RNA, um, single-stranded RNA, sense strand, anti-sense strand, and then multiple strands of RNA. Whether they're enveloped or non-enveloped, and that actually comes after the nucleic acid. So for example, the categories would be double-stranded DNA with an envelope, double-stranded DNA viruses that are non-enveloped, and then they'll be subcategorized under that. And the subcategories categories are based on size. That's it, nanometers from largest to smallest. Okay, within genera, species are often numbered. That's important to know because a lot of times you'll actually see that number designation after a particular virus. For example, the human herpes virus, right? Human herpes type one, type two, and type three are the most common, but I think we're up to like eight or nine different types of human herpes viruses. So that often designates um, the, how common the virus is, and then it will also sometimes indicate its sort of general or um, not scientific name, but it's common name, right? So for example, a good example would be um, the virus that causes smallpox. We don't call it smallpox virus, okay? Smallpox is the disease. The virus's name is actually vaccinia. Uh, that's the virus that we use for um, vaccination. The real name of the virus is variola, and the virus's genera name is variola major or variola minor. 
the major and minor being the species names, basically. So, but it, the genus that it actually belongs to, sorry, the genus it actually belongs to is Orthopox virus, right? And then its family name is Pox viridae. That's what I meant by the family names, and then viridae. So a lot of times, by the time you get all the way back to the family name, it doesn't often indicate what the particular disease is. So sometimes they're the same and sometimes not. There's a whole table, 6.7. Please do not memorize it. Please do not memorize it. It is not going to be on the test. It's just giving you some examples of common viruses and infections that you might know of, right? Just to kind of give you a little bit of something to ground this discussion in. Now, we don't say that viruses replicate. We say viruses multiply. And they, we talk about stages of multiplication for the very reason that we want to be super clear that replication refers to replicating DNA inside living cells, inside whole cells. Viruses are obligate intracellular parasites, so we do not discuss replication of the virus because the virus itself doesn't have any of that replication machinery or those enzymes or even the nucleotides to build uh, copies of its DNA or RNA. So we refer to it as multiplication. And I'd like to start, as I mentioned, with if you're looking at the handout, it's uh, section E. We're gonna start with multiplication of bacteriophage, which are viruses that infect bacteria. And I'm gonna talk about two different types of multiplication cycles that bacteriophage exhibit. And then we'll go back and talk about uh, animal viruses real briefly. Again, briefly because this is not a virology class and we're going to speak more about individual viruses and how they multiply and what kind of genome they have, specifically that you'll have to remember later when we actually come to the sections about different disease, uh, different human systems within animals and the diseases of that system, right? So we'll talk about herpes virus when we get to skin because, or the nervous system because it's an infection of the nervous system that's manifested on the skin. Right? Not in this chapter. All right, so I would like to now spend a little bit of time talking to you about the two major life cycles or the two major multiplication cycles, I should say, for bacteriophage. And your book is currently using. And I'm going to move you guys over to the chalkboard. A little bit better. Uh, I made it worse. Get a little bit better picture. That's not so bad. All right, so let's get rid of replication here from last time, chapter nine. And again, today we're going to focus on bacteriophage first and the multiplication cycle of bacteriophage. And again, it falls into two multiplication cycle categories. One of them is one type of bacteriophage that we call a lytic cycle. The other is what we call a lysogenic cycle or lysogeny or a lysogenic phage. All right, so bacteriophage, also just be abbreviated as phage, or you might hear some people call it phage. So these are viruses that actually infect bacteria. Thank you. 
So these are viruses, like I mentioned, that infect bacteria. They do not infect you. They do not infect any other kind of organism, just bacteria. And as I mentioned, they come in basically two, they exhibit two different uh, types of multiplication. They are either what we, we call a lytic phage or lysogenic. The phage that we're going to discuss specifically in this case is the um, lytic phage. We're going to talk about what we refer to as the T-even phages. And they infect our favorite laboratory rat of molecular biology and microbiology that would be E. coli. The lysogenic phage, those, the poster child for that that we're going to discuss is called lambda phage, like the Greek lambda. And it also is a, a its host is E. coli as a bacteria because it's the most studied phase that we have. So first let's look at the lytic phase or the lytic cycle. So lytic phase, like it implies, it lyses its host. So the steps for a lytic phage, and I'm going to draw one of the T-even phages because they actually kind of look like this. So it has a capsid, it has a neck area covered with sheathed protein, and then it has these tail fibers that stick out. And here there's a little plate um, that has tiny little pins in it. And I'm going to make the DNA inside the phage a different color. I'm going to make it orange. These T-even phages, these lytic phages, they are double-stranded DNA. And I know that orange didn't just show up very well. Let's try the brown. Does that look very different? <laughs> A little better. And as I mentioned, their host is E. coli. So here I'm going to draw an E. coli and I'm going to just make the E. coli DNA blue over here and double-stranded DNA, circular, right, abbreviated circle, not gigantic. And the first thing that has to occur is the phage has to, we call it attachment. And in particular, we don't even use the word attachment, we use the word adsorption, A-D-S-O-R-P. Yeah, I know. And that means the bacteriophage has to find, there's little receptors on the surface of E. coli that the phage um, tail pieces, actually the tail fibers bind to. That's part of adsorption. And then the phage, literally, it releases an enzyme. It does come with an enzyme, and that enzyme is lysozyme. And lysozyme breaks down peptidoglycan. So the lysozyme kind of softens up the surface of the bacteria, and then the phage actually I'm just going to draw it next to it over here. It actually compresses down like a little hypodermic needle, like this, and it actually injects the DNA into the host, into the host bacteria. That step is called penetration, because the DNA is penetrating into the host. Now, analytic Phage. So this is step one, adsorption. Step two, penetration. So this is step one, this is step two. The very next thing that happens is the phage DNA is transcribed and translated because the E. coli, it doesn't know that this is foreign or not self DNA. So when the phage DNA is transcribed and translated, the first protein that's coded for is a protein that breaks apart the host chromosome. That's the first thing the phage DNA does. It destroys the host chromosome. It breaks it into pieces. That way, there'll be no interference from the host trying to make its own protein and its own messenger RNA. Okay, so adsorption, penetration, I'll take a look at it. 
And the third step, we would call a duplication of the phase, multiplication, synthesis. Right? Your book is calling it duplication. So I'll use the vocabulary. We used to call this um, the synthesis phase. So in the handout, it's probably labeled like that. And I would remind you that the most important thing that the phase has to accomplish during this phase, during duplication, is it has to do two things. During duplication, it must copy viral DNA or phage DNA. So it has to make genome. And the second thing that it needs to do is it needs to produce make viral proteins. So to do that, it is going to have to use the host cell machinery for transcription and translation to the host RNA, the host nucleus, the host amino acid to produce more phage, right? So I'm going to draw, I'm not going to try to draw that but I would normally draw extra copies of the DNA being made and extra pieces of the phage proteins. Then we have assembly, and that's just like it sounds, the new phages get assembled. And then step five is release. I think your book is calling this maturation, flash assembly, and then release. And the release is lytic, which means it's going to break a hole into our E. coli and release its phage RNA. And I think I even put that on the handout. The new phages, it will make between 50 and 200 new phages per host cell, which is a lot. So there's a couple of pictures that I want to show you, and then we'll come back to the board. Um, Draw what happens in a lysogenic cycle because it's different. And it's important because some animal viruses are lytic and some animal viruses are lysogenic. So you're going to need uh, both of those. So let's take a look here. And there's just some uh, pictures that I wanted to show you. This is my one of my favorite ones. Let's see. There's that list of some of those. Your book does this second. So here's the lytic cycle described just um, as I described it. Adsorption, penetration, duplication, or you know, uh, synthesis, assembly, maturation, and then release. They uh, make it a little longer than needs. This is the picture I wanted to show you, is that this is an E. coli that has released, it has been lysed because of all the phage and the phage are going to go on to infect neighboring E. coli cells. But what I want you to notice is some of these phage have already attached to the cell that's already dead, and they're starting to inject their DNA. Right? They don't have a brain, right? They just bind to the host, and as soon as they bind, they increase. They just inject their DNA inside and try to take over this host. But this one's obviously already dead. All right, now the second type of phage infection is what we call a lysogenic phage. And I don't have that in my set here because I think these were for a different uh, class. So in lysogeny, very similar in that the phage, we're still talking about bacteriophage, is going to adsorb, penetrate, but there's a change. After it penetrates, it does not stay as a uh, a linear piece of DNA, it forms a circle and it tricks the bacteria essentially into thinking that, oh, I've just gotten a plasmid, right? Because the bacteria has defenses, as we know, those of you that follow molecular biology or refer to CRISPR, right? One of some of the bacteria have defenses against viral infections with phage. And when there's random pieces of linear DNA inside of them, they have enzymes that attack those pieces of DNA and chop them up in attempts to prevent an uh, infection with phage. Now, for lysogeny, 
and I'm gonna just draw off of the picture that I already have over here. White spot is on the parts that I've already drawn. Lysogeny is a little different in that, again, silvophage adsorbs, silvophage injects the DNA, the E. coli DNA, and I'm just going to draw it like this now, and each DNA here. So it's still it's going to inject its DNA, but rather than leaving it linear, it's going to form a little circle. And quite honestly, then what happens is there is a recombination event between the phage DNA and the host chromosome. And the phage DNA actually integrates into the host chromosome. And that is what we call, when it's like that, we call that prophage. Your book is also going to call these lysogenic phages uh, temperate, I think, phages. Yes. And the cool thing is, once this phage has integrated into our E. coli, so now I'm going to draw the chromosome as blue and just put a, a little bit of the brown piece of the phage DNA, right, that was in here and now went into the cell. This, when you have this integrated, I'm going to refer to it as a prophase. And now, every time this E. coli replicates, which remember is going to be every 20 minutes, each new E. coli gets phase DNA. And this may go on for hours, days. When the bacteria experiences stress, the phage, the prophage, often cuts itself out and goes into a lytic cycle. So I'm going to put that here. So it can go lytic. So it's kind of the best of both worlds if you're a bacteriophage. So you can be. This isn't interchangeable, right? The phage has to have the DNA, the code, to be a temperate or lysogenic phage to begin with. But what can happen is it can integrate into the host chromosome and lie dormant for some time and then cut itself out and be lytic. And the reason that we have to go through this and talk to you about these two different types is because, hey, guess what? Animal viruses are the same. There are some that are lytic, they infect the cells and they can get a life on. And then there are others that integrate to the ones that cause cancer, and they, or like HIV, they integrate and they stay with you for a while before they actually cause a cancer infection. Okay, so those are the two different types of bacteriophage. Now we can go back and talk a little bit about animal viruses. And I would just tell you that for animal viruses, we have the same. Um, replication scheme or multiplication scheme. It's just going to be slightly different for each type of genome. That's the picture I'm looking for. So in your textbook, I believe they do this uh, still the same. They have a DNA virus or they have, yes, they have a generalized features in the multiplication cycle of DNA animal viruses. <clears throat> Again, the steps are basically the same. We, the virus adheres. Now, the difference is, the main difference in absorption and penetration is when the virus um, absorbs, it's going to be taken in inside a vesicle. So they're showing you this a bigger picture of absorption here. And the reason that this particular virus is bound to this cell, of course, we're going to have more specificity here with receptors on the host and uh, spikes on the virus. Once the virus gets in, the, um, we actually see this engulfment and the virus gets put inside a vesicle. And then we call it uncoating. Then the virus is inside and then it's gonna take its coat off. It's gonna break down the vesicle. These viruses usually come with some enzymes that can do that. Break down the vesicle, 
and release the free DNA, or if it's an RNA virus, of course, it would be releasing RNA. For the most part, whether it's DNA or RNA, that genomic material then needs to get inside the nucleus because these are eukaryotic cells. And then how the viral DNA or RNA is going to be duplicated is going to be different depending on if it's DNA or RNA. And that's what all this business is. For the most part, mature virus does not um, um, form inside the nucleus. Um, it can, so they're showing you here the viral proteins. So we've got transcription then, and we've got translation, and then these proteins are coming back in and the virus is forming inside the nucleus. That would be if it's a DNA virus, if it's an RNA virus, then it's going to actually, the virus will assemble, right? That's what we use assembly, slash mature in the cytoplasm, and then release for animal viruses and come in two different um, mechanisms. It can be lytic, like we saw, same as the um, same as the bacteriophage, or it can bud. And so I'm showing you this uh, panel because of the budding. So this, I believe, is actually uh, a picture of HIV virus that is leaving the host cell. And you can see that the virus actually, in this case, assembles, it's an RNA virus, it's gonna assemble in the cytoplasm and it's assembling the proteins and the spikes, look, the capsid and the spikes here. And then the nucleic acid gets put inside, it's two strands of RNA. And then that's gonna get pinched off. And then what they're showing you here is this would be a free uh, infectious virus. And here's one that's just in process. And here are some that are even further behind in the process. So this would be an example of budding. However, in some cases, especially in the early infection of HIV, the virus tends to release more by a lytic event. So again, it depends on the virus and it sometimes depends on where in um, the virus life cycle um, or multiplication cycle that we're discussing. All right, so I'm gonna just flip back real fast to the handouts to make sure that I didn't uh, forget anything for that first part. So we talked about that, we talked about that, we talked about this, the steps are listed there for you again, right? Lysis or budding, and I've uh, listed the steps, penetration, uncoating, synthesis, I guess, and absorption, right? And assembly and release. And we talked about bacteria, these the phages. Um, okay, so now we should talk about um, a little bit about cytopathic effects of virus on host cells. So this is, this list that I've constructed is slightly different from the list that's in your textbook. Um, your book has this weird kind of picture now of table 6.8 of some cytopathic effects and they have listed specific viruses and the effects that they cause. I've listed these are a little bit more general so I'm going to go back and um, again we can look at some of these pictures real quick real quickly. So um, always we, we, we recognize this or we can visualize this in cell culture and this example here is a virus that causes what we refer to as a syncytium. That means when the cell, host cell is infected with the virus, it fuses with neighboring cells and it makes this giant cell with multiple nuclei. It's going to die, right? Cells, animal cells don't function with multiple nuclei. So that would be an example. And I believe the example in your book that they've given specifically is respiratory syncytial virus. Herpes does this as well, forms a syncytium, or many uh, syncytiums, syncytii, maybe. All right, second on my list, inclusion bodies. Occasionally, you can actually stain for the virus, and you can see viral particles being formed inside the cell. I believe this is uh, the case with herpes virus, or actually, this is cytomegalovirus and human cells, so the orange is the human cell, and the green is the assembling um, cytomegalovirus. Uh, rabies, as I mentioned, also does that. You can see inclusion bodies, but of course you have to um, harvest brain material in order to see that, and so that's usually a post-mortem examination of looking for inclusion to verify that was a, it was rabies infected. Um, some viruses cause cell death, 
some viruses that would be um, in that list of cytopathic effects, um, destruction of the lysosomes and thus of the host cell, so that would cause death. Uh, transformation, some viruses can enter the DNA of the host cell and then they cause the cells to do things genetically that they may not be supposed to be doing, like produce a certain protein or stop making a different protein. And then these two are also related, inhibition of mitosis and loss of contact inhibition. And you can see they're opposites. So again, it depends on the virus. Clearly, if a virus is going to inhibit mitosis, we're going to be more likely to form one of those syncytium. Loss of contact inhibition. Cells, um, when they are normally in tissue culture or when they're normally in an organism, they form a monolayer and they touch each other and they stop multiplying, they stop doing mitosis when they're touching cells all the way around. When you infect with some viruses, they lose contact inhibition, which means they lose the ability to tell or to know that they are touching other cells. And so they think there's a gap in the tissue and they, that triggers mitosis. That would form a tumor eventually, right? That would be loss of contact inhibition. So it's kind of complicated because it's a, it's a double negative, right? So contact inhibition, stop growing because we're touching. And then we have the loss of contact inhibition that's gonna cause the cells to multiply uncontrollably. Those are the big cytopathic effects. Also, they list, your book list, just uh, basically cell death, right? And again, I mentioned that as far as lysis. Um, and sometimes people, also just designate if they can tell if there's a viral infection based on what they say is transformation, which means the cell doesn't look like it normally looks. Um, the cells usually kind of, most cells in a monolayer, they kind of like a pork chop. And then um, if you infect with virus, they tend to form a perfectly round cell and they tend to form clumps. So your book also lists that one. Growing viruses, that, those are some kind of fun pictures. So I'll show you some of those. Uh, so if you're going to grow a virus, basically what you need to do is you need to grow the host. So if I'm going to grow a bacteriophage, I would need to grow bacteria. And you would grow them in a monolayer. And I'm pretty sure in this uh, book, that picture is still in here. So I'm looking for it real quick. Again, remember the PowerPoints with the words are not important because I'm not going to use them for the test. right? And these are from a really old edition of the book, so don't ask me for them. Plaques. Oh, I thought we would have a picture of plaques. Well, that's kind of crappy. Let's see if they do one in your current textbook. No, they do not. So I'll try to drum up a picture of a plaque. So if we're talking about bacteriophages, um, they form plaques because the bacteriophage actually, of course, um, actually, I want to the bacteriophage, of course, actually lyses the cells and it forms, if you have a lawn of bacteria, you actually see empty places and the empty places have a name. Those are called the plaques. This picture is showing you some transformation um, or unusual looking cells. This looks like an animal virus infection. And so most of the time, the reason I'm showing you this is because we would grow cells in culture uh, in plastic, we call it in vitro, in the glass, in the dish. And this would be a monolayer of cells they look like when they're normal. And then after we infect them with virus, you can see that they've become odd shaped and they start to form these clumps. So that's, if you're gonna grow an animal virus, you would want to either grow them, we would say in vivo, which means in the whole animal. Most people don't do that until they're actually testing it, um, a treatment for a particular disease mostly because of the expense um, to house the animals, feed them and care for them while you're monitoring their viral infection. So we grow cells from animals in tissue culture. And I can talk to you more about that if you're interested. And then um, on the third li on the list there is uh, growing the cells, growing virus inside an embryonated chicken egg. And you can see, I think it's even more generic than that. They say bird egg, but basically they mean chicken egg because they're the most uh, easily obtained. And you, there are several injection sites you can see. This would be injecting the virus into the yolk sac, into the 
or chorion on there, the amniotic cavity, or actually right into the embryo. And you can see a technician injecting um, embryonated eggs here, probably with flu virus. And the reason people use this is because it's cheaper than using the whole animal and it's such a nutrient environment. And there's so many actively growing cells here that the virus, once it infects some of these cells, it can multiply to really high numbers really quickly. Um, and as I said, it would be less expensive than um, using whole animals. And that's the end of the chapter. Um, I will try to include, I'll just briefly mention prions and other non-cellular infectious agents. So prions are protein only that act similar to viruses, meaning when they uh, bind to a cell and enter a cell, and these are mostly seen only in animals, I believe, prions, they convert neighboring cells, they corrupt their proteins that are normal into this abnormal form, and then it spreads or moves from cell to cell. Uh, it, there's no trace of nucleic acid, so this is a protein only, which is why it's called a prion, and so we would consider them also acellular or non-cellular infectious agent. They are responsible in animals for things in humans, Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease, as well as in animals, uh, scrapie and sheep, and um, there's a version that infects pigs and minks and cats and something else that I forget right now. Um, it affects the nervous system. There's no treatment, no cure. Um, once you're diagnosed, it's just a, kind of a long, slow, painful death. Uh, some things to moderate the pain, but you can't reverse the effects of it. And then lastly, your book also mentions some viroids. These are pre predominantly uh, plant infections that are caused by virus-like particles. The difference being they're very small and they are only composed of naked strands of RNA. So it's the opposite of a prion. So there's no protein, there's only RNA, and uh, uh, viroid doesn't have DNA. So it's RNA for a genome. It can infect a cell and then um, cause um, obviously some economic damage to particularly to food, things we use as food crops.